merci de vous joindre à nous. Thank you very much for being here at the uh, HCC Alumni Consulting Club Masterclass, Cracked It. Uh, what is important for us is uh, to uh, create a community. The Consulting Club is one of the biggest ones. We have tried to do two to three conferences each year, and all the conferences are available uh, online on the HEC Alumni uh, YouTube channel. So, so for us, it was very important to know how close you are to the book. So the question <laughs> we ask is, uh, can you give us um, a personal example of a complex situation you faced and that will allow us to better know you and better be connected to uh, the topic of the book? You start. You, start. Mm -hmm. like you start. you want me to start? Yeah. OK. Um, so this is a, it's a true story, uh, and it's a very recent story, and it's a story about my role at McGill University, so I'm going to pick a problem very close to home. So as associate dean, I sit on the executive committee for the school, and as you might imagine, we have meetings where we talk about the, the different programs, how well they're doing financially, or in this case, not. So I was in a meeting very recently, and there was a slide up on the screen, not unlike this, and the slide showed two things. Uh, one, there were bullet points or points on the graph that showed the goal or objective for enrollment for that particular program. And then there was a red arrow that showed a very clear downward trend. And as you might imagine, that spoke to me as, well, that's a classic definition of a problem. This is where we'd like to be, and this is where we find ourselves. And the friend of mine that was, was presenting this data said, this is the state of this program. Before he could get another word in, very quickly the conversation amongst the people in the room turned to, this is how we're going to fix this problem. This is what we need to do. So of course, my marketing colleague said, this is a marketing problem, so we need to figure out how to promote the program to get more butts and seats. And the finance person said, no, we need to figure out what the cost is, what the return on investment's going to be. The operations management person started talking about the logistics of the program. So sort of seeing this problem through their very narrow perspective. And I let this conversation go on for a few minutes, and about five minutes into it, I raised my hand and I said, I hate to be the one that actually has written a book about problem solving recently, but I think before we actually start talking about what the solution to this problem is, maybe we need to figure out what is exactly the problem, and let's figure out what's, what are the underlying causes of the problem before we can actually start entertaining ideas for solutions to the problem. Now, m my point is this you have a bunch of PhDs, and maybe that's where the problem started, is that we had too many PhDs in the room. But we had a bunch of bright PhDs in the room, we saw a very simple problem up on the board, and we ignored what we should be doing, which is sort of starting very carefully disciplined, like in terms of stating the problem and then starting to structure it, understand it, before we had conversations about solving. The unfortunate uh, aspect of this example is that we're still at a point where there is no resolution. The good news is, is we have put together a committee, because again, we're academics and we believe in committees. We've put together a committee to, to very carefully start to investigate this problem, better understand it before we actually come up with solutions to how do we actually improve the enrollment in this program. Je vais le raconter en français. Euh, J'ai dû aider un chef d'entreprise à résoudre un problème qui était euh, qu'un de ses concurrents l'accusait d'avoir fait des manœuvres euh, scandaleuses pour, au fond, euh, dénigrer ses produits. Et euh, comme il y avait en plus de l'argent public euh, dans l'histoire, euh, je me suis retrouvé à la Cour des comptes devant des enquêteurs euh, à témoigner de ce qui avait bien pu se passer, etc. Je crois que c'est un des problèmes les plus difficiles que j'ai eu à regarder parce que, au fond, tout était... Enfin, on est face que... Au fond, on se sent face à des menteurs tout le temps. C'est-à-dire qu'on a l'impression de ne pas avoir les données. On est accusé de trucs qu'on n'a pas fait, euh, par des gens qui ont peut-être fait des trucs, mais on ne sait pas. Il y avait des consultants en intelligence économique impliqués dans l'histoire. Donc là, c'est encore pire, parce qu'ils sont censés euh, faire en sorte que tout soit confidentiel. En fait, c'est des vraies pipelettes, ces mecs-là. Ils racontent n'importe quoi. En plus, ils l'écrivent éventuellement dans des bouquins et tout ça. Et donc, euh, c'était un terrain extrêmement glissant où, en fait, au fond, en fait, le problème n'était pas... On ne savait pas bien à quoi il fallait répondre. Quoi. Il fallait se défendre contre quelque chose qu'on ne comprenait pas. Et euh, donc, très difficile, en fait, de définir vraiment le problème et surtout quel objectif on avait. À part d'essayer de résister à cette vague euh, agressive, 
savait pas comment faire. Et puis en plus, quand on se retrouve euh, interrogé finalement par des flics, parce qu'au fond c'est ça, on commence à faire très attention à ce qu'on dit. Donc il y a un problème de communication intéressant, qui est qu'on ben, on doit dire la vérité, mais aussi la présenter de telle sorte que ça ne nous nuise pas, ce qui est toujours... Euh, Enfin, la vérité, c'est grave quand même. Hein, ça, voilà. Donc, euh, à la fois confronté à, au fond à un problème très difficile à définir et puis à des problèmes au fond de comment communiquer, quoi dire et à qui. Et en se disant, ça peut avoir des conséquences euh, que je ne comprends même pas. Donc, euh, voilà, ouais, une expérience difficile. En français aussi, ce sera plus simple. Une histoire plus courte, euh, qui est en fait l'histoire de la seule fois où ma femme a eu un peu de respect pour le problème solving et ce que je fais dans mon travail. On était en train, en fait, de vendre notre appartement parce qu'on en avait acheté un autre. Et au moment où on arrive chez le notaire, on découvre qu'il y a un énorme loup, qu'on ne savait pas, il y a un énorme problème dans l'appartement qu'on vendait, je vous passe les détails, mais il y a un énorme problème, et l'acheteur ne veut plus l'acheter. Et à la fin de la journée, on l'a vendu parce qu'on a posé le problème comme il fallait en suivant la méthode de Cracked <rire> Je vous en dis pas plus, vous en saurez plus quand vous connaîtrez la méthode de Clackett. We would like to keep this informal, so please feel free to ask questions. At one point in a minute or two, I'm going to actually ask you a question. Don't worry, I'm not testing you whether or not you've read the book. It's not going to be a quiz, so my hope is the, at the end of this evening, if you have not read the book, you'll say, I have to read the book. That is partly that's our why, objective. That's why we call this a conversion, yes, not a, a conversation. conversion. <laughs> we hope Rather to convert you. you know? <laughs> Think of it as a, a religious experience. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, for those of you who haven't read the book, what I want to do is I want to give you a bit of a, a teaser for what the book is about. So what I'm going to show you, and you're the first people that actually are going to see this beyond the people that have worked on this trailer. We have prepared a trailer about the book. Now, one of the things that I learned about books that I did not know going into this effort with my friends uh, Bernard and Olivier is that, like movies, books have trailers. So we actually have prepared a trailer about the book. So this is literally the world premiere of this trailer. It's the most important skill set you probably never learned. Solving problems and selling the solutions. Meet Liz. She has a challenging job she loves. An MBA in finance from a top school and her eye on the prize. A promotion to VP with matching corner office. But instead of moving up, she may be on her way out. See, Liz's boss recently asked her to revive an ailing product line. Despite having an MBA, she hadn't learned how to solve complex problems like this. But Liz wasn't concerned. To impress her boss, she moved fast. She skipped over defining the problem and only narrowly investigated it using her favorite financial frameworks. She then zeroed in on what she believed was the cause and quickly jumped to a solution she just knew would work. When colleagues raised concerns, she ignored them. She pitched her solution by explaining how she came up with it instead of why the company should implement it. In the end, Liz did a lousy job of solving the problem and selling her solution, leading her boss to lose faith in her. Goodbye promotion. Goodbye corner office. What happened to Liz is far too common. So, how can you do it better? You'll need to recognize the pitfalls. You'll need a proven method and toolkit that shows you how to overcome them. And you'll need a set of experienced guides to show you the way. Cracked it. How to solve big problems and sell solutions like top strategy consultants by McGill University professor Corey Phelps and HEC Paris professors Bernard Garrett and Olivier Saboni. Available now. To learn more, visit crackedbook.com. So that gives you a bit of a Oh, thank you. It gives you a bit of a flavor for the book if if you have not read the book. Now, What I can tell you is that the voiceover actor that we found for this book, his name is B.J. Schaefer, he's from New York. I tried to work on him or with him on his French pronunciation of my colleagues' names. It it's did great. not work. It's great. No, it's so, great. It's, it's fantastic. It's, it's a very <laughs> Anglophone pronunciation of my, my colleagues' names. What I hope that book does is, again, sort of set up a conversation that we want to have with you. And this is the question that I want to start with. Why did we actually write this book? Now, I'm not going to go into a very detailed conversation about why we wrote the book. I want to start with a story. And the story has to do with these two gentlemen. And what I'm wondering is, does anybody in the room recognize either one? Michael Dell. So Michael Dell, the gentleman on your left, absolutely. 
Do you recognize the gentleman on the right? OK, good. I'm, I'm happy you don't. The gentleman on the right is Kevin Rollins. Kevin Rollins was a Bain consultant. <laughs> I knew exactly what he was going to do. I was expecting a boo. But Kevin Rollins was a Bain consultant that worked with Michael Dell and Dell Computer since 1996 on the very famous direct business model of Dell. He was then hired by Michael Dell and eventually became the chief operating officer of Dell Computer. He was the hand-picked successor to become CEO of Dell Computer. Michael Dell felt comfortable enough leaving the company that he founded in his dorm room at the University of Texas, Austin, back in 1984, and turned the reins over to this gentleman. So what I want to show you is what happened during the era of Kevin Rollins as the CEO of Dell Computer. So this is Dell's stock price around the time frame that I'm talking about. Because Kevin Rollins took over as the CEO on July 16th of 2004. So a few months later, the stock price peaks just above $40 a share and then starts a fairly rapid descent. So on this rapid descent, what happened was, first off, the revenue growth at Dell started to slow down. And as a result of that, their market share compared to other competitors started to decline as well. As a result of this, Hewlett Packard became the world's largest manufacturer of computers. Dell held that spot for years. HP then became the number one uh, computer manufacturer. Just a few months later, Dell started to miss analyst estimates of earnings on a quarterly basis. They, in the end, they missed six different quarters, six consecutive quarters of analyst estimates about their earnings. As you might remember, if you owned a Dell computer back at this point in time, some of them started exploding or catching on fire, which is not something you want if you're flying on a plane with a Dell computer. This is when I got rid of my Dell computer because I didn't want it to explode on a plane. Computers were exploding or igniting on fire. Then the SEC in the United States announced that they were going to investigate Dell for what they called accounting irregularities. And what this resulted in is Dell had to restate their income statements and their cash flow statements for the four previous years. There was a survey that was done. Dell every year does a survey of all of the employees about their perceptions about the senior leadership of the organization. And what this survey found was that there was rapidly declining confidence in the senior leaders of the organization. As you might expect, given the stock price falling, given the SEC investigation, given the declining market share, and so on. This, for me, is a classic example of a problem. Something has clearly gone wrong with Dell. This was a company that was once upon a time the most profitable computer manufacturer in the world, number one in market share, idolized by its employees as well as other stakeholders around the world. It has fallen on hard times as of 2007. So here's the question I have for you. If you were Michael Dell, it's 2007, your hand-picked successor has seen a dramatic decline in the performance of the organization, what would you do? Come back. Say that again? Come back, which means what for Kevin Rollins? If you come back as CEO, what does that mean for your hand-picked successor? Someone you've groomed to become CEO for over a decade. Are you going to fire him? Absolutely. Okay. Makes complete sense, right? Why does it make complete sense? Because he's a Bain guy, of course. Because he's what? <laughs> a Bain guy. He's a Bain guy. <laughs> if it was a McKinsey guy, what would, would you do, Olivia? It would be a very different interpretation, <laughs> which you're going to give us now, in fact. So if we think about this, what do we have? Well, one thing we have is that most of us, as people that work in business and with organizations, we expect that, to use an American phrase, the buck stops here with the CEO. We expect CEOs to be held accountable and responsible for the performance of their organization. So when we see dramatically declining performance on the watch of a new CEO, we say, we must hold that person responsible. Therefore, we must fire Kevin Rollins, and we must bring back Michael Dell. The trap to that is we've done what a lot of people do. Very experienced people when we make and try to, so when we try to understand and solve problems. We jump to a solution. Bad performance plus CEO means Kevin Rollins must go. Now, as you might expect, there's a bit of a backstory to this. 
So the backstory, for example, is the SEC investigation was started in response to accounting irregularities that they detected when Michael Dell was the CEO. The decision to use Sony for the batteries was a decision that Michael Dell made when he was CEO. The reason that HP became number one in market share had nothing to do with Dell because it had everything to do with the fact that they bought Compaq, the world's fourth largest manufacturer. The declining market share also was because at this point in time, the computer industry started to go through a massive switch from growth in enterprise customers to growth in end consumers. And if you knew anything about Dell, Dell was very much focused on the enterprise market. The person that wanted to transform Dell from a B2B to a B2C company was Kevin Rollins. You know who didn't want that to happen? Michael Dell. It's very easy to look at that declining performance and to say Kevin Rollins is the CEO and then to assume that we must fire him because he's responsible for the performance problem. Most of the performance problems can trace them back, not to Kevin Rollins, but to Michael Dell and other managers in the organizations. And oh, by the way, that survey that they did of the employees on senior leadership, there was one exception that many, many employees inside Dell wrote in on the survey. We think Kevin Rollins, despite the problems, is doing a great job. So again, my point to you is this. It's very easy for human beings to look at a little bit of information, come up with a very coherent story in our heads, and very quickly jump to a solution. And that can have, as we will see over the course of the evening, some disastrous consequences. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand this over, because what I hope I've done is given you an interest in problem solving, but now I'm going to talk a little bit about why should we care even more about complex problem solving. So he's going to give you some data, and then I'll be back a little bit later, and Olivia will be back a little bit later. Thank so the you. floor is yours. Uh, sorry. So what should we care? First, I mean, I will give you some, some data, basically, some facts. So this is from an article in Harvard Business Review, and uh, it's about the most important skills across all management positions that you need the most to become leaders, to have leadership positions. And interestingly, interestingly enough, solving problems and analyzing issues comes second. The thing is that the first one, inspiring and motivating others, is a tautology. It's the definition of leadership, isn't it? So you need to inspire people and motivate people in order to be a leader. Thank you very much. I could have guessed, <laughs> OK? Uh, integrity and honesty, I would call that ideological. I don't know whether you really need that. It's an endless debate. But the interesting part is actually problem solving and issue analysis comes very close to the top. Actually, it's the top real one, OK? Uh, for example, it, it's much more important than uh, developing others, which should be, I mean, everyone tells us it's the most important part, or displaying a strategic perspective. You know, problem solving comes ahead of that. Uh, this is a study by uh, The Economist, the intelligence unit of The, ec uh, the Economist about uh, driving the skills agenda. So basically, what are the skills that the students need that we need to train people in so that they have great careers? So the question was, which of the following uh, would you say are the most critical skills for employees in your organization to possess today? Problem solving is the, fir is the first one, uh, with 50% of the people saying that this is the skill that people need the most in order to perform in our organization. Isn't it interesting? Look at, for example, digital literacy. It's only 16%, which is very fashionable, but uh, very lower on the list. Emotional intelligence, only 12%. So if you compare that to problem solving, 50%, it's really impressive. And 70% of these people expect the importance of problem solving is going to increase over the next years. Okay? So not only it's important now, but it's going to increase. So all the story about you know, artificial intelligence replacing human problem solving is actually wrong. They are complementary. People think that in the future, because we have a more powerful technology, we will need even more 
the human value add to actually drive this technology. So it's a good news for us, or for you. The good minds, the well-trained minds, are going to be in high demand. And the price of the minds, the human minds, is going to go up just because, you know, the evolution of the world, so the problems are becoming more complex. There is a lot of technology to help, but you, we need to drive that properly. This is in the same vein, the World Economic Forum, you know, the Davos Forum. Uh, so it's the Future of Jobs report. They, they compare the top 10 skills in 2015 and then the prediction for 2020. Complex problem solving is the first, is the first one. Second one here in 2020, critical thinking, which is directly linked to problem solving, the ability to think critically. And then creativity, which, was al uh, which is also linked to that, and Corey will demonstrate that a bit later. Okay? So these are the skills that are predicted to be the most important uh, for, for just having a job, you know, having a career. Even probably even more interesting for our students, I love to show that to my MBA students. Uh, this is a study uh, from the Financial Times on recruiters, people that hire freshly baked MBA graduates from business schools in consulting companies, in big corporations, etc. What are the skills that they think are the most important, the skills that they think they must find in the, in the candidates, or, and on the basis of which they are going to actually select the best candidates? you can see that the ability to solve co complex problems is part of the top five skills that they want in uh, MBA graduates or business school graduates in general. More importantly, the second question is, what are the skills that are the most difficult to find when you hire these people? And again, ability to solve complex problems is in the top five. So not only they want it, when they hire people, young people, but also they say that they have a hard time finding the people with the right skills, right? So we said, okay, here there is a very big education gap, right? The recruiters want that from our graduates, but actually we don't teach them. We don't teach that properly in business schools. We take for granted that our students are able to solve problems because they have been doing math in high school or something, or class preparatoire. But actually, we, don't, we didn't formally train them in problem-solving skills. So this is why we decided to change and actually to create a course. So I taught that yesterday and today, basically, in the MBA yesterday and the, the master, so the Grande École today. Uh, we have a course in the problem-solving methodology, just to teach the students how to solve problems and then how to communicate the solution, how to give good presentations to convince people, to convince their boss or their clients that they actually came up with the right solution. This is a Bloomberg job skill report, what recruiters want, so it's the same idea. So the table here, uh, you, uh, this is the, it's, it's a matrix, on the right, uh, uh, the up, uh, up corner on the right, th so these are the less common and more desired skills. Again, same thing. Complex problem solving is both in high demand, but too uncommon, too rare. Okay? The thing is that solving complex problems doesn't come naturally, and most of the time we haven't been taught it. Okay? That's the problem. So uh, perhaps you can. So what happens run? when we try to solve problems, despite not having been taught? What happens to people, very smart people, very bright people, very well-intentioned people, when they try to solve problems? We're going to walk you through a few of the stories that are in the book, uh, which each of these stories will illustrate an aspect of the problem-solving method. So that's a way of uh, telling the story. The first story is the story of digital music. When, about exactly 20 years ago, digital music started to be a big thing, it was piracy, basically. It was MP3 files that were ripped from CDs and that were illegally exchanged over the internet between students. You remember that time when there was Napster and all those services that let you exchange files. That became a big thing around 1997, 1998. 
mostly among college students who were the big buyers of music. And the whole music industry in the US started being really scared of what was going on. Because obviously, if the college students stop buying those $14 CDs uh, and instead have music on their PCs, you know, that's a problem for them economically. How did they respond? They did something very simple. They said, actually, this is piracy. This is illegal. This is a crime. They're stealing music from us in exactly the same way that people who 20 years ago were selling tapes that were copies of our you know, cassettes, that were copies of our CDs or records at the time, were stealing from us and we stopped that. And just like people who are selling bootleg CDs on the night markets of Bangkok are stealing from us and we're, we have to stop that, so we're going to stop that. And this is piracy on a larger scale. So it's not just a bunch of people with a bunch of CDs. It's a big thing, so we need more resources to stop it, but we've got to stop it because this is a crime. And so they went to the police, which is what you do when there is a crime. And they all ganged up together, uh, 18 record companies. They sued the operators of those sites, including Napster. And in record time, in 18 months, they got Napster to shut down. And they declared victory. And of course, as we all know, they hadn't won anything. What happened after that, in the following 10 years, the music industry lost 90% of its revenues. By the way, for an industry to lose 90% of its revenues and still exist tells you that there was some fat there. Right? I mean, it wasn't the most efficient industry in the world. But they lost 90% of the revenues. Who was looking at the problem at the same time and looking at it very differently? Apple, which at about that time, a couple of years later, launched the iPod and then the iTunes store selling the music for the iPod. And then, of course, the iPhone, which was built on the success of the iPod, although we tend to forget that. What was the difference between these two approaches? One group, the music industry, defined the problem in one way. They said it's a piracy problem, we've got to stop the piracy. Another group, or in fact company, because there were many people doing the same thing at the same time, said actually the way to think about this problem is how do we make money with music in a world that has become digital? That's a very different way to look at the problem. So what you see in this situation is that the first pitfall when you're trying to solve a problem is to define the problem wrongly, is to define the problem very often in a way that is reminiscent of things you've seen before. So, oh, we've seen piracy before, we recognize this animal, it's a larger one than the one we've seen before, but it's the same species. In fact, no, it's not the same species. The way to think, if you look inside the book, the way to think about solving problems, about stating problems is, as Einstein famously said, if you've got an hour to solve a problem, spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem definition. And uh, the approach we propose in Cracktit starts with the first step. You'll see there are four steps and each of them starts with an S. So we call them the four S's. The first step is state the problem and we propose a method for stating the problem that will help you avoid the flawed problem definition pitfall. So that's the first story. I'll tell the next one. The second story is yeah, the second story. story. Uh, so, a picture. Do you know these people? Yeah. Yes, you do. Yes. So, tell me Zidane. who they are. Zinedine Zidane. Zinedine. Yeah, everyone recognizes Z Zidane. <laughs> who else? Anto uh, not Antoine, but Franck Ribou. So, he was the CEO of Danone at that time, uh, the predecessor of uh, Emmanuel Faber and the son of Antoine Ribou. And Yunus. Mohamed Yunus, right? Mohamed, Mohamed Yunus. So, Mohamed Yunus, what, who is this guy? What he did he do? He <laughs> yeah, the microfinance yeah. scheme, right? And he got the Nobel Prize, right? And uh, so microfinance, everyone knows that? Microcredit, yeah? Lending to poor people so that they can uh, start their business. Yeah, exactly. Small, small yeah, so lending small amounts of money to very poor people so that they can invest in something and create their own job, basically. That is the idea. It rests on the idea that indebted poor people are wealthier that than non-indebted poor people, which is questionable, but anyway. So that is the microfinance part. 
Uh, and Frank Ribou, CEO of Danone, and Zinedine Zidane. So what are they celebrating here? You know the story of the Grameen Danone joint venture? No one knows? Yeah, you know. So yeah, please. Or you can say it in French if you prefer, as you like it. So basically, they try to create a, a yogurt uh, for India, and um, actually, it didn't work because of uh, um, the conditions of the markets, which were not adapted to the product to make it simple. Okay. Yeah. Well, it was not in India; it's in Bangladesh, but the story is the same. So actually, they uh, well, actually, they had a lunch. These two people, Frank Ribou and Mohamed Yunus. And they said, OK, we should combine our abilities or activities to try and alleviate child malnutrition in Bangladesh, which is a big problem. Uh, and so uh, you, Mr. Ribou, you manage one of the leaders in packaged food in the world. Uh, I, Mohamed Yunus, have access to these very poor people in rural areas that have the problem. So let's bring them the food that they need for the children. Very noble and, you know, uh, relevant objective. And so they decided to create this joint venture. And when they actually uh, inaugurated the plant, because they, they actually built a plant in Bangladesh, they invited uh, Zinedine Zidane as the famous, you know, star to make it even more visible and interesting for the media. Okay? So the picture was taken at the inauguration of the, of the factory. Then what happened? So you said it didn't, it didn't succeed, right? No, it didn't succeed because um, so the product was not adapted to the heat of the um, yeah. uh, transport condition. Or not. Right. So isn't it obvious? I mean, why choose yogurt? to solve this problem. I mean, it needs refrigeration. It's a very hot country. These people don't have fridges. We, it will not work, right? I mean, it's impossible. Plus, yogurts are made of milk. Milk is actually very expensive there, I mean, compared to other types of food. So doing something like a biscuit or dry, uh, you know, uh, product would make much more sense. So why did they do that? Because they, they, they studied the project, they built the factory, they tried, they hired ladies, women, to sell, to carry and sell the yogurts uh, to, you know, to the villages. And after a few months or weeks, these ladies actually quit because they couldn't make a living uh, out of that, right? So, I mean, all that is kind of easy to predict. Of course, we see it in hindsight, so it's easier. We know it didn't work, so we can imagine reasons why it didn't work. But the reasons are kind of obvious. So how is it possible that these people, educated people, experienced people, leaders, Nobel Prizes, you know, they make so obvious mistakes? Why is it so? That they went to what they knew. Excuse me? They went to what they knew. Right. Actually, they went, yeah, exactly. And they started with the competencies of the two organizations and tried to combine them in order to solve the problem. The problem was well stated. Child malnutrition in Bangladesh, in a particular area, they had targeted uh, the market and everything. But then they started with the, the products they had and the access they had through the Grameen, uh, the Grameen Bank system with the Grameen ladies, etc. And so they tried to replicate that and it didn't work, okay? Actually, the, the problem here, or the pitfall, is solution confirmation. We call it solution confirmation. CEOs, leaders, consultants, I mean everyone, when you try to solve a problem, you actually what you do is that, as Corey said, you jump to conclusions, you start with a candidate solution. You have a solution in mind already when you look at the problem. Mm. And of course, the solution is in your backyard. It's something you are used to, right? And uh, you try to adapt that. Actually, you try to adapt the problem to the solution instead of doing the other way around, okay? So this is basically what they did. 
And uh, this is the danger or the pitfall of being hypothesis driven. In consulting companies, we tell people you should be hypothesis driven, otherwise you will lo lose a lot of time, waste a lot of la time looking at things that are useless. Well, in fact, being hypothesis driven is very dangerous in some cases because unconsciously you are going to try to confirm the solution you have in mind and unconsciously you are going to ignore the data that don't confirm the solution you have in mind and you are going to focus so much on this hypothesis that you will find ways to uh, justify it anyway. Plus, when the two CEOs say to their organizations that this is the project we are going to implement and they are willing to put money, they are willing to create the factory, to hire people, etc., it's very difficult to object, right? These people, they are in charge of that. They say they are going to create the joint venture. I mean, they are leaders. They need followers. So you f we follow, okay? And, uh, and that's, the, that's the issue. So the remedy to that is actually to be issue-driven instead of being hypothesis-driven. So this is not new. A guy, a guy called Descartes, very well known, <laughs> already said that in the 17th <laughs> century. So what we did in Crack Did is uh, just to kind of rejuvenate a little bit this idea uh, by saying, okay, instead of starting with hypotheses and candidate solutions, start with the issue itself and try to decompose this issue into smaller issues, etc., that you can manage. And of course, challenge all the issues, challenge all the questions, so that you are sure that you investigate all the necessary uh, areas in order to solve the problem, okay? So the, this is the second S. So Olivier mentioned the first S, state the problem properly. Uh, now this is structure the problem properly. So once you have stated it, you need actually a method to analyze it, to decompose it, but, and this method must be issue driven. It must start with a question instead of starting with a candidate solution. I know it sounds obvious. It sounds obvious. But if you think at, of the way you and we actually solve problems, this is not what we do in general. We tend to have a hypothesis in mind, explicit or implicit, and we try to confirm it instead of looking around. Okay? Yeah. In fact, here, the problem that had then uh, was to sell more yogurt, and they wanted to uh, to reach the more people for their yogurt. So I, I think the problem is also that, that you have two problems. You have one problem was it say we want to solve uh, the problem of uh, Bangladeshi, but in fact, what he wanted to solve is to sell more yogurt and to reach people. So. You mm -hmm. see what I mean? It's uh, which problem you address. Yeah. So this is back to the statement part. Yeah. No, I agree on that as well. I mean, this is part of the statement part, which is exactly which problem are you exactly trying to solve? And probably they wanted to do too many things at the same time. Okay. But then, uh, I mean, having said that, uh, having identified the issue, then it's even more necessary to look at the different components, right? And to see whether this joint venture would help sell more yogurts. In fact, it didn't. So what they ended up doing was to sell the yogurts in, the, in supermarkets, in cities, instead of reaching the poor population. So they didn't create the new market they wanted to reach, okay? So even had they stated the problem that way, still, they would have had to you know, structure the, the, the analysis properly so that they reach the objective. Okay, let's move on. Wow, you can't see him very well. No. Okay, so there's a trend here. The trend is to show you pictures of smiling people <laughs> and then tell you how they really screwed up. <laughs> so here's another story about a smiling person and how he really screwed up. I don't know if you can quite make it out, but, but this is Ron Johnson. Does the name sound familiar to anyone? Do I have any people that love Apple, in particular Apple stores? Like Apple stores? This is the guy that created Apple stores. So Ron Johnson was the senior vice president of merchandising for a company in the United States that used to be called Dayton Hudson. It's now called Target. You know how Americans pronounce the store Target? 
Target. Because we think if we pronounce it en français, it sounds a bit chicer. And that's exactly what Ron Johnson did. He took a mass merchandising discount store in the United States and made it chic. So when Steve Jobs decided that he wanted to forward integrate into retailing, this was the guy that he hired to create the Apple stores. Now what do we know about the Apple stores? They are the most successful physical retailers on the planet as measured by dollars per square foot or per square meter. Now, Ron Johnson built the Apple stores, was extremely successful, and then another company came along to recruit him. And you can't really see it in the slide here, but the company was J.C. Penney. Anybody know J.C. Penney? What's J.C. Penney? Say that again, I'm sorry. It's, it is, whoa. I don't know if you could really compare J.C. Penney to Gallery Lafayette. It is a department store. You're right. It is a provincial Gallery Lafayette. Yes. So, but it's, it's, wow, you're not doing Gallery Lafayette any favors by comparing it to J.C. Penney. So, J.C. Penney is a national chain in the United States of department stores. When Ron Johnson came in, they had a little over 1,100 stores. But JCPenney had fallen to a great extent on hard times. Sales were down, sales per square foot, same store sales year over year were down, stock price was down. So he was hired to save JCPenney. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you very quickly the story about what happened when Johnson was hired to save JCPenney. This is a graph of the stock price, but the point I wanna to make to you very clearly is that shareholders loved the announcement of Ron Johnson becoming the CEO of JCPenney. So much so that the day that it was announced he, was be, he would be CEO, JCPenney's stock price surged by 17%. There was no other news about JCPenney released that way, or that day. So again, we can basically imagine that shareholders love this. Now, very quickly what Johnson did is he said, I know exactly what the problem is, and here's my solution. His solution consisted of three strategic pillars. Pillar number one, Johnson said, our customers at JCPenney hate sales, hate discounts. The year before Johnson was hired as CEO, JCPenney nationally did 600 sales promotions. It's almost two a day. And he said, what we are doing by having 600 sales promotions is we are lying to our customers. What he meant by that is I grew up in the United States in Montana. I remember JCPenney, that's where my mom took me to buy clothes. If you walked into a JCPenney store, what you would see is the following. You go to a rack and you'd see the price tag and it would say $30 and you'd see a red line through it. And then you'd see $28, you'd see a red line through it. You'd see $22, you'd see a red line through it. <laughs> and then you'd see the final price. What had happened? Discount, 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 discount. And Johnson's point was, we're not telling people what our real price is. With all these discounts, we're lying to them. So here's my solution. We're gonna get rid of all sales promotions and we're gonna become an everyday low price merchandiser. So strategic pillar number one, no more sales discounts, everyday low price. Strategic pillar number two, if you walk into a JCPenney store when I was a kid, this is what you saw, menswear, children's wear, home wear, women's wear, women's lingerie, etc. Merchandise organized by function. And Johnson said, that's not the way people want to shop. People want to shop by national brands. So his idea was 100 boutiques in a store. You walk into a JCPenney, you see the Levi's boutique. You see the Martha Stewart boutique. You see the Joe Fresh boutique. So you'd see 100 boutiques. And rather than sell clothes or other merchandise by function, you'd sell it by national or international brand. And in the middle of the store, you would have a town square, an open space that you could congregate, meet your family, and talk about your purchases. The other thing he did was he started to make small changes in terms of the way clothing were sold. So in the days when I grew up, you would walk into a JCPenney store, you would see a uniform JCPenney salesperson standing behind the cash register. Johnson said, we can't have that. We gotta get people out onto the sales floor. And we gotta have people look hip, look fresh, look contemporary, because JCPenney was known as an old, stodgy type of uh, retailer. So what did he do? 
He started to hire very young people. He allowed them to dress in their own personal style. He outfitted them with tablet computers so they could go onto the sales floor and they could check you out on the sales floor rather than force you to go back to a sales register. The final thing he did with this was he said, we're going to create a brand new brand name to reflect these new strategic attributes. So he dropped the name JCPenney and JCPenney was to become JCP. And JCP was the logo. You can't really see it. It's in the upper right corner. It was a red square with a lot of white space with a little blue square and in white lowercase letters JCP. Very clean, very contemporary, very sleek, very slick. So what happened with his solution? It was a disaster. <laughs> Told you, smiling guy, disaster story. What happened? Well, let me give you a few, few numbers. The first year after he implemented this solution, same store sales chain-wide fell by 25%. Fell by 25%. In terms of revenue, revenues declined by $4.8 billion. What else happened? Stock price fell off a cliff. What else happened? They had to dig very deep into debt. So their bond rating on their debt in the United States fell from essentially A to triple B minus. So junk grade territory. Now, you might be wondering, what did all this cost? Well, it's alleged to have cost over a billion dollars to roll out these changes. The new advertising campaign to announce the, the, the new brand, to announce the everyday low pricing strategy, and then to completely redesign the stores to reflect this 100 boutique. So he spent a billion dollars only to be met with a disastrous decline in revenue, in profit, and in stock price. So here's my question. Does his solution sound vaguely familiar to any of you? Sleek merchandise sold by hip young people with tablet computers in a very wide, spacious... It's an Apple store. Okay, so what's the problem here? The pitfall here is reasoning by analogy. This is what we do as human beings. In other words, when we see a new problem, it's very common for human beings to ask ourselves the question, have I seen a problem like this before? And then to say, what worked there? The solution that worked there. And then to say, that problem looks an awful lot like this problem. Therefore, the solution that worked there will most likely work here. What worked for Ron Johnson at Target, he took and plugged it in to Apple. And he basically assumed, hey, that's going to work here. And again, my point is, that's an assumption. What was the problem with that assumption? Yeah, but it's still the same uh, margin, not, not the same um, sales per square meter. Totally different. No, that's, that's true. So Apple stores were much greater in, in terms of sales per square meter. But, but what's he assuming about that solution? It worked at Target. It worked at Apple. Not the same product. Not the same product. OK. Ah, customers. What's he assuming about these customers? That they were hype, hype guys who would buy uh, clothes just like uh, an iPhone. Yeah, well, at the very basic, he assumed the following. Our customers don't like sales promotions. Are you so sure? <laughs> what if customers really liked sales promotions? He didn't bother to find out. He merely assumed that JCPenney customers are like Apple customers that are like Target customers. So what worked at Target, what worked at Apple, is going to work at JCPenney. Now, if the customers like those things, maybe they like the way the merchandise is laid out. And oh, by the way, if you think about the stereotypical JCPenney customer, which was my mother, she would walk into the store, and if somebody that was 22 years old with a weird haircut, wearing a JCP t-shirt, walked up to her with a tablet computer and say, ma'am, can I take your credit card? <laughs> my mother would have walked out the door saying, you're not going to get my credit card. <laughs> He's reasoning by analogy. And what reasoning by analogy is, it's a set of assumptions. We assume that worked one, a solution that worked one place will work another. And he never bothered to verify or validate 
his assumptions and it got him into trouble. Now, for me, the big kicker is the following. There, I've read many articles about this story and in a few of them, there is a claim. I don't know if this is true or not, but the claim is the following. When Johnson was asked, why don't you test out your idea in one or two stores? Because if you scale this up across 1,100 stores, it's going to be really expensive. And it's going to be really risky. Johnson's response was, we didn't test at Apple. <laughs> so if we didn't test things at Apple, why do we need to test things at JCPenney? So again, reasoning by analogy is a reflection of a broader problem. We make assumptions, and oftentimes we don't bother to validate those assumptions. So in the book, when we talk about solving problems, the third S in the 4S framework, we talk about the toolkit of design thinking. Because design thinking, if you're not familiar with it, starts with the following premise. If we're going to solve a problem for real human beings, because again, what we're talking about, JC pro Penny's problem was with their customers. Why were customers buying less and less and less? So rather than assume we understand what our customers want, design thinking says, let's start with empathizing with our customers, which means let's start to try to see the shopping experience from the perspective of JCPenney customers. And let's use the insights that we generate from that deep dive, that empathizing with customers, to then come up with a more accurate definition of the problem and use that definition of the problem to then generate potential solutions to ideate. And then, let's not assume our ideas are right, let's prototype those solutions and test them quickly and cheaply. And only after we go through this rigorous discipline process and converge towards the final solution, should we think about scaling those solutions up. In other words, selling them and implementing them at a large scale. So in the book, we talk about the toolkit of issue trees and hypothesis pyramids as a way to solve problems, but we also talk about design thinking as a toolkit to solve problems in a creative way. So we've walked you through the first three S's. We've got one more S left to go. So for that final S, selling, I'm gonna turn it back over to Bernard. Okay, so this is a book. So no smiling guy, it's a book that the title of this book is Pure, White and Deadly. You cannot read the deadly part, but Pure, White and Deadly. And this is sugar. Okay, sugar as a skull, you know, with the bones here. So the book says sugar is deadly. Sugar kills you. Sugar is the main cause of obesity, of uh, heart, heart attacks, etc. Okay. This is uh, this is actually a revolution in thinking because if you think of it, what we have been told for decades is that fat was dangerous and that fat was the was the main cause of obesity, heart attacks, etc., etc., etc. We have been told so for. Well, since basically the 60s or the 70s, or the, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. And only recently, nutritionists conducted studies to demonstrate that actually sugar was the guilty one. And uh, in the meanwhile, the problem is that, for example, the soft drink industry or the packaged food industry has stuffed the food with sugar to eliminate fat and to give taste and also to eliminate uh, some other products that they didn't want you to feel when you, well, but it's a different story. But in order to eliminate the fat, they actually put sugar and also salt and other things, okay? So it, it's actually a health disaster, okay? Now, and now we are trying to revert to the right theory, which is that actually sugar is the most dangerous uh, food, okay? So, when was this book published, in your opinion? Give me a date. Huh? Yes, you're right, actually, in the 70s. You knew that? No. It was, you're right, it was published in the early 70s. And in spite of that, and there was in this book the whole proof 
the evidence, the studies, the biochemistry, theory, everything to demonstrate that the big problem was sugar, not fat. In spite of that, fat was the assumed to be the guilty, I mean, the problem for decades. And only now, I mean, a few years ago, nutritionists started to say, okay, it's a different story, etc., etc. Okay. And in the meanwhile, actually, the curve of obesity st was still growing and we were eliminating fat from the diet and still obesity was growing and no one asked a question, basically, in the public. That is weird, isn't it? And the book, The Wool Proof, everything was said 40, 50 years ago. How is it possible? Well, the problem is that the guy who wrote this book didn't communicate his theory correctly. He had the right solution. He wrote a book. He, was, he went to the government, uh, to, to the US Congress. To, he was a British guy. He went also to the UK, etc. At that time, he was the leading British nutritionist. But he wasn't heard. Because at the same time, there was a, an American, a US competitor, that, had, that defended the fat theory. And this guy was a professor, a university professor, and he conducted a study to demonstrate that fat was the problem. And actually, he was very clever. And probably this is uh, one of the oldest examples of misuse of big data in science, because he had a lot of data with correlations and everything. And actually, he misinterpreted that for a series of reasons I will not uh, comment. But this guy was very good at communication. So he convinced the government, he convinced the scientific authorities, etc., with his theory and with his data, his study, etc., etc. And everyone go, uh, went the wrong way. Okay? <coughs> so the inability to communicate the right solution can be very problematic, it can be very detrimental. Uh, because obviously, a good solution which is not communicated properly is like no solution at all. Because it will never trigger action. If you are unable to convince your boss, your client, that you have the right solution, it's like not solving the problem actually, because no action will be taken. Perhaps you will be listened to, but that's it. And it remains, the report remains in a drawer. Okay, so we must be very good at communicating the solutions. But on the other hand, a great, a, a great storytelling ability that makes you able to actually communicate the wrong solution is also very dangerous. So this is why in our work we have tried to connect the problem solving part with the communication part how you can convince people that the solution is right. This is very powerful, this is very important, provided you have solved the problem properly. Okay? So we try to make this connection, and in particular to demonstrate that it's not by telling the story of the search and the story of how you came up with the solution, which is what this guy did, that you are able to convince the, 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 the people in charge that you have the right solution. You have to find a different way to create this <laughs> conviction, okay? So, uh, well, this is the selling part. So this is the fourth S in the, in the, the method to avoid this pitfall of miscommunication. So, uh, perhaps, Olivier, you, you want to take over? Uh, I can wrap up, you yeah. So basically, the, the four steps of the method, of the problem solving and communications method that we've talked about, are summarized here, you have to state the problem, you have to structure the problem, so state with the right problem definition, structure with issue-driven or in some cases other approaches, solve it including techniques like the creative thinking of design thinking, and finally sell the solution with techniques that we um, describe in the book. To summarize, it's a critical skill set, it's a skill set that is not taught in most schools and now that is taught at HEC but is not taught in most business schools, it's a skill set that you probably have all developed as consultants, but we surmise that you have people in your teams, you have people at your clients, you have people that you deal with on a daily basis who don't necessarily have the tools that you've learned. In fact, we get a lot of requests from consulting firms that want to use this as a training tool, 
from internal consulting departments in companies who want to you know, uh, give a common language for problem solving and communication to their teams. So that's the sort of um, use that we have because it doesn't, it's not taught and it doesn't come naturally. And the logic of having the sort of method that we describe here is to provide a shared structure to the people who are working on a problem together and have to communicate their solutions together. And also to give them discipline and confidence in driving their problem solving and communications effort and hopefully to improve their effectiveness as consultants or as business people. That's basically the story and with that we thought we'd give you uh, ample time to ask questions and comments and so on and so forth. We sent you an email uh, to have a couple of questions uh, so that we could launch the Q&A. Um, so several participants uh, ask us, what is the difference between a uh, complex problem and a uh, complicated problem? A lot of people are talking about those differences. Could you explain more about that? Well, I can, I can try. Uh, often people will tell you it's a complicated, the, the theoretical difference, I guess, would be you can have a very complicated problem that is analytically complex and that is in fact, analytically complicated, sorry, and that in fact is not complex. So if you need to do a very you know, long division, right, you divide two very large numbers, one by, by the other, it's complicated, it's not easy, but it's actually not complex. You know exactly how to do it. The sort of problems we deal with here are problems that are actually hard to frame, hard to define. When you are Ron Johnson, or when you are the music industry, or when you are the scientist trying to solve the problem of obesity, you don't e exactly know what sort of problem you're dealing with. You, you can't quite get your arms around it, which is why these very smart people in these examples actually got it wrong. And which is why a lot of complex problems actually get solved in the wrong way. So when people talk about complex problem solving as the skill set that we're talking about here, that's what they mean. They don't mean you know, being very deeply analytical and doing complicated things. They mean getting your arms around a very complex problem. I, I think that's the, the idea. We had another question about what are the limits of your approach? Look, I, I'm an academic by training, so I immediately go to, well, what do academics say about the definition of complexity? And Herb Simon, who was a polymath, the guy was the father of artificial intelligence. He was the father of modern behavioral decision theory. He was the father of great work in areas of mathematics. What he said is complex is if you've got lots of interdependent pieces to a problem. Now what that usually means in practice is if you're going to solve it, solve it, you have to draw on different domains of knowledge. And this is where the contrast with complicated comes. Complicated means, and I think Olivier's point about math, you can have a mathematical problem that is very complicated in that it consists of a series of steps that you have to get exactly right. But you're drawing on an extremely narrow domain of know-how to do that. A complex problem like the one I described earlier tonight with our program at McGill meant that we had to understand something about customer behavior. We had to understand something about logistics. We had to understand something about marketing, something about finance. It requires the integration of a variety of different skills. Now, this gets me to what's the, uh, the limitations of this problem. In the world of problem solving, you have complex problems, and the extreme form of those problems are called wicked problems. Some of you may be familiar with this term. A wicked problem is something that is immensely complex. Let me give you an example. Global warming is a wicked problem. It is a wicked problem because it has tremendously immense number of interacting causal factors that we as human beings and even our artificial intelligence tools do not understand how those things interact. If we do not understand it, it is going to be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to solve it. So the limitations of our approach is that it's great for complex problems where we understand the interrelationships and we have the diverse expertise that we need. But where it starts to reach its limitations is where we don't understand the interactions of these complex causal factors. Therefore, issue trees start to break down, hypothesis pyramids start to break down, and the toolkit of design thinking starts to break down. So I would say wicked problems are those that we still, as, as, a, as a species, have not quite figured out how to solve. But if we have to tackle any challenge, I think that's the challenge we want to really tackle. 
So I hope that helps. The, 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 I mean, the, the real answer is because the tools, the, the, the sort of framework of thinking that we largely borrow from is the toolkit that the consultants have developed. Now, we've done a couple of things. First, we've attributed it to its actual real roots. The consultants, I've been one for a long time, I've got a lot of respect for them as well. They haven't invented anything. You know, what they do goes back to Descartes, as Bernard pointed out, and to Aristotle, and to a few other you know, good thinkers, but basically it's packaging of good solid logic, which for some reason we've stopped teaching. So it's important to actually bring this together, but the people who have given this method a name in business tend to be the consultants, and that's why when people face a complex problem, they very, very often call consultants, so that's why we refer to them. The other thing we've done is we've actually combined this with a few health warnings about how not to fall in the traps in which people fall when they try to work like consultants. For instance, hypothesis-driven problem solving, as we've discussed it, is the sort of trap that consultants know how to avoid, but when people try to apply the tools of consulting in a regular organization, that sometimes creates a big problem, and we discuss at some length why. And finally, the last thing we've done is we've included a big section about design thinking, which is or wasn't until recently an approach that most consultants used, now they do, uh, in fact is much more of an approach that is modeled on how entrepreneurs and creative people tend to solve problems. Designers, in fact, are the initial observation based. And what we've tried to highlight is for what types of problems you would want to think like a traditional narrow-minded McKinsey consultant, and for what kinds of problems, I've been one for a long time again, and for what kinds of problems you would want to think more like an entrepreneur or a creative problem solver who uses design thinking. And we actually do think that some problems fit better in one category and some problems fit better in another. So for some things you should think like a consultant and for some things you shouldn't. So to your point, the subtitle of the book doesn't do justice to the complexity of that story, but that's where the publisher forces us to simplify. <laughs> that's the also, also to perhaps to further elaborate, this is also why we decided to work together. Because we wanted to combine the competence of uh, an experienced consultant with uh, Corey's skills, which are more in the design thinking and innovation part. And myself, I am just a strategy professor trying to you know, discuss cases with students. And I think it, it answers your question in a way. So consulting is clearly, it is clearly not the only source, but uh, the idea is to broaden it by bringing together different views and trying to integrate that. I think this is our, our small innovation, is just to try to combine these different approaches together in a consistent method to help people tackle a relatively wide array of potential complex problems, including the ones that require uh, some creativity and innovation, which, let's face it, are not the main areas to which uh, consultants contribute in general, <laughs> to put it mindly. Merci pour cette présentation. Je voulais vous demander quelle est, de votre point de vue, la, la part de l'organisation dans ces biais et dans ces erreurs communes que vous avez euh, soulignées. Beaucoup de vos exemples semblent partir d'erreurs individuelles, euh, mais j'ai le sentiment que, finalement, c'est plutôt au niveau des organisations qu'on se, qu se trompe et que ces biais euh, apparaissent, euh, et que, bah, pour parodier l'autre, le bon sens est la chose du monde la mieux partagée au niveau individuel, mais pas forcément collectif. Mais en même temps, le design thinking, c'est de la multidisciplinarité. Est-ce que le problème n'est pas aussi dans la solution Et comment est-ce qu'on fait travailler ensemble ces intelligences L'exemple de Corée tout à l'heure, c'était que justement, chaque département et chaque silo d'entreprise ou d'organisation va résonner avec sa vision, ses KPI qui ne sont pas alignés. Et tout le génie du design thinking, c'est d'arriver à travailler en multidisciplinarité, mais c'est aussi de là qu'il y a un problème. Alors, comment est-ce qu'on travaille au niveau d'une organisation pour éviter, pour éviter ces biais selon vous c'est ce qu'on appelle une excellente question, nous les professeurs, parce que comme la réponse est incluse dans la question, ça aide énormément. Quoi. Euh, donc, comme disait Aesop, la langue est la meilleure et la pire des choses. L'organisation ou le, le travail d'équipe, le travail collectif, c'est la meilleure et la pire des choses. Et c'est tout à fait vrai. Moi, je partage complètement ça. Donc, nous, en fait, ce qu'on raconte finalement, c'est, je suis d'accord avec l'idée que beaucoup d'erreurs 
peuvent venir effectivement de l'organisation et de, de, de justement faire travailler une organisation. Quand on pense à l'histoire de Danone, c'est clair qu'ils ont réussi à embarquer toute une organisation sur une fausse piste. Et c'est un travers de groupthink d'une certaine façon. C'est-à-dire quand on se met à penser en groupe et que tout le monde a tendance par désir de conformité, au fond, à penser la même chose, et au lieu de profiter de la diversité, en fait, on la tue immédiatement, quoi. C'est-à-dire, on, on crée une équipe et tout le monde se met à penser pareil, quoi. C'est un phénomène... Euh, et notre désir de conformité, il est extrêmement fort. Et c'est une limite à notre esprit critique, c'est clair. Donc, euh, oui, ça, c'est une partie du, du problème. Notre façon, au fond, d'y répondre, c'est de dire, euh, au fond, comme tu le dis aussi, c'est que la solution, elle est aussi dans le travail d'équipe et la diversité, à condition de l'organiser correctement. C'est-à-dire que, alors, par exemple, pour euh, ce matin, j'ai fait travailler les étudiants sur « state the problem ». Et donc, on leur donne un framework qu'on appelle « the Tosca framework ».« Very powerful uh, »,« to state the problem ». So, I, 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 I just assign that to them and I say, « Okay, this is the case study. Please state the problem in teams, in small teams. So, there are four or five students working together. » It takes them one hour to agree on a problem definition. And sometimes, actually, their problem definition is extremely bad. Okay? But it takes them one hour to come up just with the problem statement. And, and, and the funny thing, Bernard, just to add to this, is that when you give the problem to them, they say, it's obvious, you know, we don't need to spend an hour defining the problem. You've just told us what the problem is. It's, it's a case, right? We, we know what the problem is. It's only when they start to do it as a team that they realize that they in fact have very different ideas of what the problem is. <laughs> and so they start arguing, they spend, they spend you know, uh, a long time, and at the end they have a kind of compromise, which is actually very shaky, and it's not a, it's not a good definition of the problem, even for a very simple thing. And then they say to me this morning, well, I couldn't believe that it would take us one hour for five people to write a correct sentence in English with an interrogation mark at the end, you know, one hour for that, right? So both the problem and the solution are in teamwork because you need this cross disciplinarity. You need this. So the students we have are, for example, they are very international. So they come from different countries, very different backgrounds. And so to agree on something is actually dif difficult. So there is a cost associated to diversity, right? And they realize that. But they also realize that it's by, you know, criticizing each other and trying to build on what the other guy said that actually you come up with, the, with, with an interesting uh, contribution. So, yeah, so, and also what I tell them is, look, you have spent one hour destroying actually what the first guy said. This is what you did. There was the first input, and then you criticized it, and then you reached a compromise, okay? And I said, look at the value of the first two cents you put in the machine. It's so important. It's something that is not going to remain, but it's the first contribution, and it serves as a basis for the rest of the team to, you know, discuss, etc. So it's so, it's priceless to have that. So dare do that. You have to propose something. And then it's going to be challenged. Fine. You know, this is the process. And then in order to, sol to solve this uh, cost or to reduce this cost of diversity, I think what we provide here is a method. What people need is actually a method. So people are smart. People make mistakes. And people have a hard time building on each other to reach uh, something, right? To agree on something. So what they need more than anything else is a method, a common method, because it gives them a common language. And so if you have a common language, even though you come from different horizons, you can exchange and build together something. So, yeah. Okay, a question on the, on the last S, so yeah. the, the selling, I think. Can you hear me? Uh, you went very fast on the selling, so I've got uh, the thing that probably I need to read the book to understand what is the selling. But my question is that it feels that the selling is coming at the end. My personal experience is that the selling is at the beginning. Uh, can you uh, maybe you, 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 you seem to say yes, but uh, 
uh, it's the, the question is is more if you are not associated to the, the, your client at the beginning to understand the problem, how can you sell at the end? Actually, yes and no. So <laughs> let me try to explain why yes and no. Yes, absolutely, you don't, you know, if you have a client, let, let's assume you have a client, which is the simplest case, you're not going to wait until you've solved the entire problem to come to the client and to say, here's the solution, it's a complete surprise to you, I know, but let me explain to you why this is the solution. Now, of course, you know, anyone who's done any, anything actually in life, not just consulting, knows that would be silly, right? So the selling is a process of interaction that starts at the very beginning. Now, the reason we put it at the end, other than the obvious you know, logical flow, is to highlight something that sometimes people lose track of, which is that you want to sell the right solution. And there's a pitfall that we actually don't, didn't elaborate on today, but which is frequent, which is to start by asking, how are we going to sell this solution? How are we going to communicate it before you ask what the right solution is? That's a problem you see all the time in politics, for instance, where you see, you know, oh, not what should we do, but oh, how are we going to sell this, right? That's also a problem you see in organizations, where people confuse what is the right solution with how are we going to sell it. Now, you may come to the conclusion that the, the ideal solution is one that cannot be sold to your constituents, and therefore you need to change it, right? But it's a very different thing to limit your frame of thinking from the beginning because you start with the mindset of an advertising person. I was an advertising person as well, so I can criticize advertising people. You know, if you start with the mindset of an advertising person instead of the mindset of a problem solver, you may miss some of the, of, of the strategic options, some of the answers that you might have to your problem. So, of course, you know, we're not implying that the selling starts only at the beginning when everything has been done. It's a process of interaction. And in particular, it's a process of interaction with your client on the problem definition, on the problem statement at the very beginning. You know, do we agree on what we're trying to sell, to solve? But you don't want to limit your problem solving with your communication thinking, if that answers your question. Comment you faites travailler finalement l'organisation pour à la fois être agile, mais en même temps avoir une approche un peu un peu structurée, comme on peut pas non, c'est pas facile. Je vais, je vais, je vais essayer de répondre rapidement, mais c'est parce que c'est un, un très vaste sujet. On a, euh, on a essayé de, de se placer dans la perspective de euh, Lise dans la petite vidéo que vous avez vue au début, qui est une personne dans une organisation à qui on a balancé un problème en lui disant « débrouille-toi euh, ». On ne s'est pas placé dans la situation de celui qui conçoit l'organisation pour se dire « Comment est-ce que je la dote de méthodes où les gens vont travailler ensemble de manière efficace dans la durée Ce qui est un, un autre vrai problème. Euh, et un vrai problème pour éviter le groupthink dont on parlait tout à l'heure, pour éviter plein de problèmes qu'il y a dans les organisations, et auxquels, je crois, certaines des méthodes auxquelles vous pensez, euh, servent à, à réagir de manière plus... Enfin, à prévenir de manière plus systémique et plus organisationnelle. Ici, on s'est vraiment dit, mettons-nous dans la peau de quelqu'un qui a un problème un peu exceptionnel, qui va être traité en dehors des méthodes normales de l'organisation. Ça peut être un PDG, ça peut être un entrepreneur, ça peut être un consultant à qui on a délégué la tâche d'avoir ce problème, ça peut être un chef de projet d'un projet interne dans une organisation à qui on demande de jouer une sorte de rôle de consultant interne, ce qui arrive de plus en plus souvent, et qui n'est pas a priori équipé d'une série de méthodes euh, automatiques, entre guillemets, ou prédéfinies avec lesquelles il va, il va gérer ça. Je ne sais pas si ça répond à votre question, oui, mais oui, c'est un, un, un angle un peu orthogonal. Sur un angle de mission ponctuelle, finalement, je dois régler un problème, voilà. ce que ne fait pas nécessairement la méthode agile. Ce que ne fait pas forcément la méthode. La méthode vous donne un, un tunnel dans lequel vous faites passer les problèmes, et de temps en temps, il y en a un gros qui ne rentre pas dedans. Quoi.